me, Kelly, and this is what I would look like if you were looking at me from the bottom of a creek. I work for a local organization called Sound Salmon Solutions, and I'll be your guide today as we explore the world inside of Marysville Creeks. Join me to look for life underwater in Jones Creek. Right now, I'm taking a look to see how healthy the habitat, our home is, in this water for salmon, as well as for the bugs that they eat. If you were living in this water, where would you find shelter? Where would you find food? What is the water quality like in this creek, and how does that affect what you would find living here? And what do our actions as humans have to do with the water quality here? Our journey begins here in Marysville, Washington. For over a decade, students from the Marysville School District have been joining Sound Salmon Solutions staff at this special site. The creek we are visiting, called Jones Creek, runs through neighborhoods, under roads through culverts, along backyards, and then eventually becomes a part of the water in the Puget Sound. From the location where we study Jones Creek with Marysville students, we're really close to Allen Creek Elementary. We're so close that sometimes we could even hear the students at recess after lunch. Today, we're at Jones Creek looking for these weird little stream bugs called macroinvertebrates. While macroinvertebrates might be a term that you haven't heard before, Let's go ahead and break that down into a couple of pieces. So for instance, you might have heard of micro before, which is when something is so tiny that you need a tool to be able to see it. When something is macro, that simply means that it is large enough to be able to be seen with the unaided eye. An invertebrate, on the other hand, is an animal that doesn't have a backbone. So we, as mammals, have backbones as do other animals, such as birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. This is an animal that is an invertebrate. Go ahead, you can say out loud if you know what kind of animal it is. Now, if I would have shown you this picture first, you probably would have had a harder time answering that it's a dragonfly. But believe it or not, this is a dragonfly baby. And when dragonflies are babies, they actually live in the water. You may be wondering why we are looking for these macroinvertebrates, or stream bugs. So just like the dragonfly baby you just saw, pictured here is another type of macroinvertebrate. This is a stonefly baby, also called a stonefly nymph. Because the life cycles of these animals are connected to the water, Scientists can learn about the water quality in a creek by looking at what kind of macroinvertebrates they find inside. Some macroinvertebrates need very clean water to live, and others can tolerate some pollution. Now we're going to head out to Jones Creek to see what kind of bugs we can find. Hold on though, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Now that you've had a chance to learn about those macroinvertebrates, or stream bugs, and you've also had a chance to learn about how scientists use them to understand water quality, what I wanted to show you is what it looks like when we're actually out here collecting them. So today, I'm standing in Jones Creek, and I'm going to collect some of those macroinvertebrates that we're going to use for our investigation so that we can better understand what the water quality is like in Jones Creek right now. So I have a couple of tools with me. I have a net that has a very long handle on it and that helps so that you are able to uh, collect macroinvertebrates even in deeper water than this. I also have a five gallon bucket with some water in it and that is about to become the temporary home for these macroinvertebrates until we sort them, do the investigation, and then after that we will be re-releasing back into Jones Creek itself. So take a look and uh, learn how to collect macroinvertebrates. So the stream is flowing from that direction to this direction. So what I'm going to do is I am going to put that net in the water just downstream of me. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my feet and the water gently in front of the net. And what I'm doing is I'm loosening up those stream bugs that are clinging to the rocks underneath me they're flowing into the net and then what I'm doing I'll take a peek look inside what kind of see what kind of things I'm getting and then I'm going to type that into the temporary home of those macroinvertebrates and then I'm going to do that process a few more times Thank you. 
now that I'm done collecting, what we're going to do is we're going to go up on shore and see what kind of things we found. I've poured everything from that five gallon bucket into these two bins, and now we're going to see what we can find living in there. Remember when we were underwater at Jones Creek looking around? Believe it or not, all of these macroinvertebrates that we see here were in the rocks on the bottom of the creek, attached to the leaves, and stuck to the logs. How many different kinds of stream bugs do you see here? Feel free to pause this video when you see interesting stream bugs so that you can take a closer look. Scientists will often take field notes with drawings to help them learn more about what they're observing. We'll take a look in the second bin as well. This is the other half of the five gallon bucket sample that I collected in the creek. Again, in this bin, look closely for movement. Can you believe all of these macroinvertebrates are living right in our creeks? Scientists use field marks or distinguishing characteristics to help them identify animals. These field marks can be things like the size, shape, color, pattern on an animal, sometimes even things like how an animal moves or even what it sounds like. Which macroinvertebrate here is most interesting to you? How would you describe it to somebody else? In just a moment, we'll identify what types of macroinvertebrates we found, and based on what we found, we'll actually be able to learn about the water quality in the creek. In your packet and on the Jones Creek website, you'll find this identification key. On the top, it says key to water quality bioassessment using macroinvertebrates. Whew! That may sound like a lot of big sciencey words, but believe it or not, that is exactly what we're doing today. We are using macroinvertebrates to learn about the water quality of Jones Creek. When you look at this key, you will see that there are three separate sections. The stream bugs in the top section are in a red box, and it says group three, tolerant to pollution. That means that they can live in water that is of pretty low quality. The middle box says group two, partially tolerant to pollution. These animals can handle some pollution, but not as much as those group three stream bugs. The bottom box says, group one, intolerant to pollution. These stream bugs need clean water in order to be healthy. And if you find a lot of them, you probably have pretty good water quality in your stream. Inside the boxes, you will see the macroinvertebrates that we can find in Jones Creek. You'll need to look at those field marks or distinguishing characteristics to help identify them. Pay attention to things like the shape of their bodies, how many tails the animal has, and how many legs the animal has. Another useful item that you'll find in your packet and on the Jones Creek website is your data sheet. Go ahead and put your name at the top and we'll fill this out together as we go along. I've separated out our sample and I found seven different kinds of macroinvertebrates. How would you describe this first one? Does it look similar to something you've seen before? Now take a look at your identification key. What looks most similar to you? Okay, I started with an easy one. It's a worm that's aquatic. Looking at your identification key, you'll see that this is an aquatic worm. The other thing we need to know for our data sheet is what group it is in. Since it is in the middle, the yellow section, it is in group two. Now we'll write this information on our data sheet. Please feel free to pause if you need a moment. This was our aquatic worm, and in the next section where it says, check which group it belongs to, we'll put an X in the box for group two. Our next macroinvertebrate is much bigger and honestly much weirder. Look at the segments and look at those interesting lobes on the end. This is the larva or baby of a flying insect that you might have seen before, but the name might be unfamiliar to you. Take a look at your identification key. Please pause the video if you would like to decide what this animal is and you're just not ready yet. The answer is coming in three, two, one. It is a cream fly larva. Look at those segments and those finger-like lobes. Later, you might wanna look up a picture of an adult cream fly and decide if you've seen one before. Moving on to our data sheet, we will write in cream fly larva, and then it was in the same box as the aquatic worm, so that will be a group two as well. Remember to pause if you need more time. Continuing along our journey of wormy looking things, what stands out to you about this stream bug? 
I observe that one portion is wider and one portion is more narrow. The part that is more narrow is a little darker. We had lots and lots of these in our sample, and I promise you've seen the adult of this animal before. Go ahead and take a look at the identification key. What do you think? Here comes the answer. Pause if you aren't ready. Drum roll, please. This is the black fly larva. If you look in bird baths that haven't been cleaned in a while or small ponds, you'll likely see a lot of these attached to the side. Let's write that on our data sheet. They were in the top box, meaning they are in group three, and they can handle polluted water better than some of the macro invertebrates we are seeing today. This next one is really challenging. It moves really, really quickly. It also looks like it's swimming on its side, which is unusual. Go ahead and watch its behavior for a little bit, and then I'll show you a closer up picture. This is a sketch of the animal. You'll notice it kind of looks like a shrimp. In person, they are so clear or translucent that you can sometimes see in their stomachs. Now take a look at your identification key. What do you think? This is a scud, also known as a gammarid, but most scientists I know just use the word scud. Moving on to our data sheet, I'm writing in scud, and it is another one of those group two stream bugs. All right, this one is really cool. This is one of my favorites. How many legs do you see? How many tails do you see? Those things on its abdomen or stomach are gills. Did you notice this stream bug when we were looking at the videos of the macroinvertebrates that were all together? Moving on to our identification key, I see two animals that look similar. How many tails did our bug have? This one has three tails while the other has two. I can also see those gills on its stomach. I think it is not a stonefly. You may have guessed it, we have a mayfly. Take a look at this image and you'll see all of those unique field marks. Three tails, three pairs of legs, and those gill flaps. Something very special happened as I was filming. This mayfly hatched, which is the term for when it transitions from being an aquatic nymph, or baby, and becomes an adult. This one did it right on the side of my sorting container. I only saw two tails on the adult, which confused me. If you look at this picture of an adult, it does look like in this life stage, it only has two tails. Moving on to our data sheet, I'm writing in mayfly. Look at what group it's in. It's in group one, which means it's more sensitive to pollution. This is our first group one bug. Back to another hard one. You saw lots of these in the bins before I sorted, and even one in with the mayflies. They look like breakdancing worms. This was the biggest one I found, and it wasn't moving as fast as the little ones. The segments on this one are important to identification, and I'll give you a hint that it's in group three. The midge larva, you can see those segments, and if we had a magnifying tool, we may have been able to see the tiny legs on each end. Moving on to our data sheet, go ahead and fill out the next entry. You've got it, midge larva, and from what group? It's another group three. And last but not least, this macroinvertebrate. It has a hard body, dark in color. It also has little segments. And when it flips over, we'll see three pairs of legs. Go ahead and take a look at your ID key. What do you think? Answer coming in three, two, one. It's a riffle beetle larva. I don't see them very often. Another group two bug. Now that we have all of our bugs identified, we're going to add them up and see how many we have from each group. We have one group one bug, four group two bugs, and two group three bugs. If you're up for the challenge, pause the video here and complete the next section below. If you prefer to be walked through it, here we go. Now we are going to move those numbers down and multiply them against different values. The more sensitive the group is to pollution, the higher the number they are going to be multiplied against. We have one group one bug, and one times three is three. We have four group two bugs, and four times two is eight. Lastly, we have two group three bugs, and two times one is two. What is the sum of three, eight, and two? That's right, it's 13. 
Now we're going to look at this table and see what a 13 means. It means that the water quality is fair. There are a lot of things that we do as humans in our community that can have a positive or negative effect on water quality. In our next two videos, you'll be learning about another way that scientists test water quality, and you'll learn about what you can do to be a steward or helper to protect water quality for people and salmon right here in Marysville. Thank you for joining me today on this important research.